of the Old Testament stated his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the Mighty God the Everlasting Father not the second person of the Trinity not the Everlasting Son the Everlasting Father Hallelujah and the Word of God declares the Apostle Paul states that it pleased God that all fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him Jesus personally hallelujah so when we look at Jesus Christ we're not seeing one of three members of the Godhead the word of God said we are seeing the fullness of the Godhead the term Godhead simply meaning all that pertains to to God. The word Godhead that you read in your New Testament Greek literally translates from a word that simply means all that pertains to God. That term has been twisted and perverted to try to mean, you know, this divine threesome. Well, that's not what it means. It means literally all that pertains to God. Hallelujah. It pleased God that all that pertains to God, everything that is divine, should dwell in Him bodily. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, before I go into my message this afternoon, I just want to share a few words, if I may. Hopefully, those of you watching will give me a little latitude here. I won't take too long, I promise. I'll try real hard. But, you know, we are just about to exit the month of February. And February is set aside as Black History Month. And the Spirit of the Lord has been kind of dealing with my heart in the last few days about some things. And I just want to share a few thoughts with you uh, before I go into our message this afternoon. Uh, in honor of Black History Month. Years ago, when I began my ministry as a young man, I don't altogether know how it happened. I really don't remember. Uh, I had a cousin who was very friendly with a lady who pastored a black uh, apostolic church in Waterbury, Connecticut. And this cousin had told me about this lady, and uh, somehow or another, I, I can't remember exactly, but I called her and spoke to her on the phone. I was just a teenager back then, and she and I developed a very nice friendship, and, you know, just, she was a lovely lady, and she and I became very friendly and, you know, got to know one another. And as my ministry progressed, I began preaching as a young adult at 16 years old. That's when the first door opened to me to preach uh, outside of makeup. And you say, outside of makeup? Well, for four years prior to uh, my adult ministry, I worked as a children's evangelist. And I had developed a clown character who is called Jiggle, J-I-G-G-I-L. Jesus is God and God is love. And that's what his name meant. It was an acronym. But uh, I did that for four years from the time I was 12 till I was 16. Then when I was 16, uh, I began to have doors open to me. I moved to Texas and really it, I think 
what kind of happened is that experience I had at the Riverside Church of God where I, my second service there and the Holy Ghost anointed me to preach and I just started preaching. And then we wound up having a, a prayer line and God healed people and delivered people. It was an amazing service. God moved. That kind of blew open the door to my preaching ministry. Then Brother Gillum asked me to preach. And other churches began to invite me. And if I went and visited a church somewhere, the pastor would say, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I'd say, well, I'm going to be. I'll never forget it. You know, I was just a teenager. And I simply said, well, I'm going to be, you know, because I, I didn't consider myself a preacher. I considered myself on the way to being a preacher. And they said, well, you know, I feel led to have you come preach for us tonight. So I began to go and preach in churches and wherever the door opened to me or wherever I was invited. Well, somewhere along the line, I began to be invited to some black churches. Church of God in Christ, uh, especially AME. Uh, some of you folks who understand the black church, you know the organizations I'm speaking of, AME, African Methodist Episcopal, uh, some uh, uh, in the black community, they call them Baptists, but a black Baptist oftentimes is a white Pentecostal. <laughs> they still use the term Baptist. But they're honestly not Baptist in the same way that, uh, like your Southern Baptists are. And uh, they shout and have the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues and worship God like we do. You know, they're spirit-filled churches, but they still call themselves Baptists. Well, over the years, I had the distinct honor and privilege, and I honestly count it a distinct honor and a great privilege to have preached in, I can't even count how many churches of color. Uh, the Lord also opened doors for me over the years to preach in Hispanic churches and what have you, but today I'm talking about my experience with the black church. And many years later, I had a friend who pastored a church of God in Christ here in East Texas. And uh, he heard how that I had ministered in Brother Cleveland Williams Church up in Ansonia, Connecticut, which was the church of God in Christ. And I had no clue in the universe who Bishop Williams was. I didn't know didn't know him that you know he was a lovely man beautiful wonderful man but uh, I didn't know it as it happens he was the second person at the time in the entire hierarchy of the Church of God in Christ well I didn't know that. when I came back to Texas and I was driving school bus and this black fellow who pastored a little Church of God in Christ uh, he and I were driving bus together you know and one day uh, we were talking and I said something about Bishop Williams and he said, you know Bishop Williams? I said, oh yeah, so I've preached for him, you know, up in Ansonia, Connecticut. He said, you have preached for Bishop Williams? And I said, well, yeah, I have. And he said, Bishop Cleveland Williams? And I said, yes, uh-huh. I said, he's a wonderful old man. He's a marvelous man of God. He said, well, you've got to come preach for me. If you preach for Bishop Williams, you, you've got to come preach for me. So I went to his little church, and I preached for him, and God gave us a wonderful time. And then all of a sudden, doors began to open, and I was being invited again to a number of black churches, you know. And I've had such a wide berth of experience preaching in uh, churches of color, I want to say. And... This particular man said to me one day, he said, do you know why our churches, that's the way he worded it, he said, why our churches and why black ministers love you and they love your ministry and they, they just really appreciate you. And I said, well, no, I really don't know, know why in particular. I never saw my relationship with the black church as being particularly special, you know. Because to be honest with you, it shows you how ignorant I was, you know. 
I, all I know is when God called me to preach, he said, go into any door that opens to you. I want you to walk through it. So wherever I was invited, I'd go. He said, brother, you have exposed yourself over the years to the black community and to the black church. He said, and you have listened and you've learned and you talk about things very openly as a white preacher that most white preachers honestly don't even have a clue about. They honestly, they don't even get it. Never mind preach about it. They don't even get it. He said, and you preach about these things. And you talk about these things. You talk about churches in the South being segregated and how that ought not to be. He said, you talk about glass ceilings in denominations for black men, for black leaders, how they can rise to a certain level within most predominantly white denominations, but you'll never see in the Assemblies of God a black general superintendent, or you'll never see in the church of God a black general overseer. I'm just telling it plain. You'll never see a black man as the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church. It'll never happen. Never ha and it's sickening, and it's sad, because God's church transcends race, and transcends skin color, and differences in language, and all of these things, background, and national origin, and what have you. But the church still operates very much under uh, the thumb of white supremacy in its own right, which explains why so many in the evangelical community fell right in behind Donald Trump and the whole mega crowd. And why evangelical churches worship the same man that the KKK and the Proud Boys and white supremacists worship. I'll tell you, it amazes me that the white church is so ignorant and stupid that they cannot for the life of them understand. They'll stand there and argue with you that Donald Trump is not a racist. He's not prejudiced. He's not a racist. Honey, if he wasn't, there is no way in the universe the KKK would endorse him. I got news for you. They don't endorse people who are mildly. Okay? They run around, when he got elected, they run around screaming and hollering and preaching and celebrating that their agenda was finally going to be addressed in Washington. All right, so I haven't said that. This pastor told me, he said, you know, you've listened, you've seen, you've observed, you've learned. I want to talk for a minute to white folks in the church who have at least a little bit of intelligence and a little bit of smarts. A little, I'm going to tell you, only simple-minded people will ever use the phrase, the answer is simple. Did you hear what I said? If you find yourself frequently saying, well, the answer is simple, then you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you straight to your face, you're very simple-minded. There are no simple answers, especially to complex questions. When it comes to the issue of race in America, there are too many simple-minded morons in the white community who think that, well, slavery is over a hundred years behind us, get over it. And that, you know, they, they simplify their concept of, of how things ought to work in the world. And the Holy Ghost has been dealing with me and said, you know, you just need to say something. Maybe some smart people out there, maybe some white folks who actually have a brain in their head will hear what you're saying and it will make them think for a minute and make them realize. There is so much more to racial identity than merely the pigmentation in your skin or 
uh, your lineage, your background, because racial identity is not only a black issue, it's an issue for uh, everybody. And what I mean by that is, Jewish people, for instance, have racial identity, okay? Uh, the minute they say they're Jewish or the minute they say their name and somebody identifies that as a Jewish name, oftentimes there are uh, prejudices and there are thoughts that come into the hearer's mind concerning them simply because they're Jewish. Do you follow what I'm saying? And Jewish people, as a people, whether they had loved ones who endured or possibly died in the gas chambers at Auschwitz and uh, under Hitler's murderous thumb, Jewish people carry that scar from history in them. The minute they say they're Jewish, that's part of their identity. When I talk about World War II and I say, well, you know, the United States, we helped win the war. Well, I got news for you. I wasn't even a glint in my daddy's eye when the United States and, you know, and, uh, and its allies were able to bring World War II to a close. And yet I still say, and many of us say, we won the war. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because it's part of our national identity. That history is part of our national identity. Well, the same thing is true of race. I had a grandmother as a kid. <laughs> she could give Archie Bunker a run for his money. I'll tell you what. She had every prejudice in the universe down pat concerning every group of people that you ever could name. And one of her favorite little hobbies was when she'd meet somebody, she'd ask them their name. And then she'd say, oh, so you're Polish, or you're Irish, or you're Italian, or you're German, or you're Russian. Now, I still, I kind of inherited that trait. Tommy will tell you, I love... Uh, to kind of guess people's heritage based on their name. But for me, it's just, you know, a hobby. For her, it was so she could apply certain prejudices. And I'll never forget when one of my aunts, my mother's youngest sister, was uh, found a man and was going to get married. And I'll never forget my grandmother telling us, he's Polish. Well, you know those Poles. She sure isn't going to like it because, bah, 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 and all of a sudden she's spitting out all these concepts, you know, about Polish people. And let me tell you something, Polish people live with those things as part of their, their heritage, as part of their identity. The minute they say they're Polish, do you follow what I'm telling you? If you used to watch Archie Bunker and all in the family, Mike Stivick, his son-in-law, Every time he said he was Polish, he knew he was dealing with people who were going to have certain ideas about him. Well, let me tell you, when it comes to black identity in America, you can say slavery is a hundred and some odd years behind us, so get over it. But every person in this country who has dark pigmentation in their skin has that heritage very much as a part of their makeup, very much as a part of their psyche, and you cannot escape it any more than a Jewish person can escape uh, the Holocaust, okay? It's part of their psyche, it's part of who they are. You also have to understand that after slavery, during Reconstruction and coming all the way through the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s, Black folks have just had one enormous, difficult hill to climb from the minute they were emancipated, the minute they were free, uh, till this day. And they're, and they're still fighting. They're still struggling for a lot of things. And there are those people like Trump and his worshipers who would love for us to go back to a time 
when they had fewer rights. If they could take the vote away from people of color, you know they'd do it in a flat minute. They're doing everything in their power right now to make it more and more difficult for people of color to vote again. Again. Because they don't like their influence in American politics. They want white people to make all the decisions. They don't want black people influencing elections. They don't want black people helping to decide who's going to run the country and what policies we're going to embrace. But you need to understand that not only do people of color have slavery in their bloodline, they've got decades of lynchings, They've got decades of being yelled at and screamed at and cussed and called names. They've got decades of people uh, not allowing them to drink from the same water fountains, not allowing them to eat at the same lunch counters, not allowing them to sit in the same uh, area of the movie theater, not allowing them to live in the same neighborhoods. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You, you can simplify it all you want to. You can try to make it, you know, oh, that, that was then and this is now. You can pull that garbage all you want to. But until you have lived the experience, until you've lived through it, and the repercussions of all these things have been massive on the black community and oppressive on the black community. That's why poverty to this day, sadly, is so rampant in the black community compared to the white community and why health care services are not as readily available. And You know, I mean, there are so many issues that go on, you know, in, uh, inequity in pay, inequity in job uh, 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 promotions and you know and races and all this all based on the color of a person's skin and it still goes on folks it still happens you need to understand that it takes a whole lot more than a hundred years or better to get all this out of your system no you, you've got to get to a whole new place where these issues are no longer an issue. And then you've got to live in that place for a long time. And then those things will become memories of the past. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. You know, in psychology, if anyone, who's, anyone who has studied psychology knows, they say, when a person has been in a long-term relationship that ends, or a person's been married and their marriage ends, it takes, listen to me, it takes as long to overcome whatever damage you may have sustained in that relationship and whatever issues you may have adopted and whatever issues have come into your life in response to that relationship. It takes as long to overcome those things and forget them and leave them behind you as you were in the relationship to begin with. Somebody who's married 20 years. I'm going to tell you something. If you think just because they wait a year and get remarried, that all of a sudden everything that they picked up during that 20-year marriage, that they've done forgotten it and gotten past it, and oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. You cannot interact with another human being for 20 years. You cannot be with them. You cannot have gone through the process of trying to work through relationship issues and do all that for 20 years and just be able to walk away from that and have it not affect you and have it not be part of your life anymore because you waited a year and remarried. It doesn't work that way. They say as long as you were in that situation, it'll take that long for you to get out of whatever issues you brought from that situation. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This country, Donald Trump and his demons, as well as his worshipers and the false prophets who endorse him and support him, 
stirred up and brought to the surface the fact that racism is by no stretch of the imagination a thing of the past in America. It's not even close. We are nowhere near having gotten past all that. So if we hadn't gotten past all that yet, then there's no way in the world we're living in a better place yet so that we can live there long enough, am I telling the truth, that the things of the past can kind of fade into distant memory. We've got white folks in America today who still want to celebrate the South. They still want to celebrate an insurrection and a civil war which was an attempt by states in the South who wanted to support and wanted to maintain slavery. They still want to celebrate these states rising up in rebellion and trying to destroy the United States of America and separate it into two separate nations. And they want their statues in City Hall and they want their statues at the courthouse. And, and folks, I'm telling you, how hard is it to understand? Is it, is it really that difficult to understand? If we're ever going to get to a better place so that these things can kind of eventually fade into the past and not be so big an issue and not be so great on our national consciousness and not be so great in the consciousness of people of color, is it really that hard to understand that we cannot all at once celebrate slavery and celebrate those who supported slavery and defended slavery and literally fought to preserve slavery? Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. My God, people, how hard is this to understand this? We've got Republicans in America today who want to bury black history in America. They want to bury all the negativity that was visited upon black people. And yet, isn't it funny, they want to bury that history, but they don't want to bury Jefferson Davis. They don't want to bury Ulysses S. Grant. You know, they don't want to bury uh, all these characters from the Civil War. No, no, no. They want, all, they want all that to stay alive. We just don't want to talk about all the evil, wicked, inhumane, horrible things that white men did to people of color in the name of, we're the better race. We're the... Oh. So I just want to tell you, as we're exiting Black History Month this, this month, as we're reaching the end of February, I just want to say to you this, understand, the issues at play are far deeper. Uh, you may think they're decades or a century behind us. I got news for you, for many, 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 many people, they are not. They're coming from generations of poverty that literally dates back to the Reconstruction. And they still haven't been able to dig their way out of that hole. Okay? There are people in this country who still struggle, you know, with um, issues that, while it, it doesn't, you know, relate to them having been a slave, but if you go back and you look at cause and effect, it's like dominoes. You know what I'm saying? And they literally, the dominoes fall all the way back to slavery. They fall all the way back to reconstruction. And you need to understand that. And please listen to me today. Anytime you hear some poor moron say, well, the answer is simple. I don't care if it's Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity. Uh, if you buy into that phrase, there's something wrong with you. There's something deeply, desperately wrong with you. You know, we've got people who want to sit on television and find fault with and criticize everything that our leadership in this country is doing concerning the Ukraine right now. And what would they have us do? 
have these people for one minute. Let me rephrase that. These people haven't for one minute <coughs> sat down and looked at the complexity of the issues at hand. They have not for one second looked at all the complexities. And yet the funny thing is, if Donald Trump were in office and he were doing the exact same things that our president is doing now, they'd be worshiping him. And they'd be counting everything he's doing as absolute wisdom. Folks, you need to listen to me today and understand. You've got to consider your source when you're hearing information. And when you have these people coming out with idiotic statements, well, it's simple. You know, no, there, there are no simple answers to complex questions. And this church and this pastor supports Black Lives Matter. And the notion that all lives matter is a pile of manure. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. And when we get there, you, I'll be the first one to shout hallelujah. But I've got news for you today, folks. We have not yet gotten to the point in America where all lives matter and until we do then we need to be reminded that someone who is a person of color their life is not cheap and their life is not without value and substance simply because their skin is darker than ours okay is it all right I want to move on now to the rest of the service if I may if you have your Bibles this afternoon I think I'm going to share that I'll probably edit that piece out and share that online just as a little blurb concerning Black History Month. And I hope it helps somebody. I hope somebody got something from that today. Mm -hmm.